Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm going to give it a few more minutes before we get started here, just to let everyone let everyone uh, in. So we'll start in about about four minutes. All right, and thank you all for attending today. Uh, today we're going to talk about virtual trade shows um, and pivoting from in-person events to an internet-based events today and beyond. Um, I'm your host, Chris McCormick. Uh, I'm a digital marketing manager at Dean Houston. Uh, I, I focus mainly on websites and uh, building out new products such as these virtual trade shows, as well as email and pretty much anything to do with the internet. Um, I have a few presenters that are with me today. Um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves. First, we have Emily Dilly, a marketing manager here at Dean Houston. Yeah, hi. Um, like Chris said, my name's Emily. I help handle some of our legacy um, accounts at Dean Houston. Um, so along with Chris, I helped Ken steward the initiative that we're going to talk about today. And we also have Justin Keyes, our web development director here at Dean Houston. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm Justin. I've been here for a little over six years. Um, I oversee a lot of the digital development processes with the company and help uh, clients kind of understand our solutions and how to integrate them uh, into their marketing, as well as doing some hands-on design and development. And last but not least, we have a very special guest today, Mr. Ed Kammerer, the Director of Marketing and Global Product Strategy at OPW Retail Fueling. OBW Retail Fueling is actually the client that we did the first one of these with, so we wanted him to come on today and just kind of help us with this and uh, give us his client perspective on it and how it worked out for their team. So Ed, if you want to give just a little introduction to yourself. 
Sure, thanks, Chris. Um, so again, thanks for uh, inviting me to be a part of this, uh, this program and be a panelist. Um, obviously, I was very passionate about this project and I'm, I'm certainly happy to uh, you know, talk to your audience about it. Um, I'm the Director of Marketing and Global Product Strategy for OPW. Basically, I, I oversee all of our marketing, product development, and engineering. Uh, I've been with OPW for 22 years. Uh, OPW, we're an industrial manufacturer. Uh, we basically make all the equipment that's found at a gas station. Um, we're part of Dover Corporation. And uh, even though I have an engineering degree, I've actually spent most of my career at OPW has been in sales. So now with my, my role in product development and engineering and, and certainly marketing, um, you know, I, I kind of keep that customer focus, you know, always at the forefront of what we do at OPW. Uh, you know, the customer obviously is very important to us. And I make sure that, uh, you know, we instill that, that customer focus, like I said, in, in our product development, our engineering, and then obviously certainly our marketing. So again, I'm, I'm happy to be a, a part of what Dean Houston is putting on here today. Awesome, we're glad to have you. Thanks, Ed. So I'd like to start everyone out actually with a, a question just to get everyone's, uh, you know, their, their, their minds thinking, their juices flowing here. So I'll start a poll here on, uh, on the GoToWebinar platform. So how many trade shows do you think happen each year in the United States? I'll launch the poll for everyone here. Just give everyone a minute or two to uh, think about that. All right, looks like we've got pretty much everyone in here. I'm gonna close that poll now. And surprisingly, it looks like everyone had in that they thought it was either 21,000 or 45,000. There are actually 13,000 trade shows in the United States per year, still a large number. Um, in each of those trade shows, the average attendance was is around 5,000 individuals. Um, of those people that attend as well, 94% of them have purchasing power. So that's why trade shows are so important to most of our clients. Um, it gives companies the ability to show their large-scale products that they normally just wouldn't be able to take on an office visit or to a client uh, directly, and it shows in the prospecting cost because trade shows actually cost about half of what an office visit costs, and companies know that. They actually, in a, in a poll that was actually put out last year, 80% of the companies that were polled said that they were either going to increase their uh, marketing budget or keep it the same as it was in 2019. But unfortunately, as we all know now, um, COVID-19 actually caused a lot of companies to have to rethink that idea. So um, we looked at a lot of our clients that, I mean, it's a major focus for most Dean Houston clients. Uh, we actually have a whole trade show division, for those of you who do not know, called Exhibit Logistics that only focuses on trade shows. So it's a large percentage of the business for Dean Houston, but it's also a large percentage of the marketing budget for a lot of our clients. Um, and it's where they get a lot of their leads each year. So we needed to figure out a way to ensure a similar ROI and then actually help them increase their leads, but then also look at the differences between a distributor uh, conference and then also what the end users need through what we would typically think of as a trade show. Um, so through that pivot, we actually wanted to meet with uh, with Ed. And Ed, I know you worked with Dale Dean, our 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 um our CEO, to actually come up with the idea for this. And you guys came up with two different ideas, both the virtual trade show and the virtual distributor seminar. So, Ed, talk to us about how you guys came up with that idea. Sure, Chris. Uh, you know, so it was early March. Um, obviously, we really start to saw, see the impact of what uh, COVID was having here in uh, North America. And, you know, we began to see that the stay at home orders and the, you know, the shutting down of, of, of events, um, you know, large gatherings of, of people. And, you know, it, it hit me. I started thinking, like, hold on a second. We have some major customer facing events, you know, that are coming, um, you know, this spring. And, uh, you know, many of those were, were trade shows. You know, the spring is traditionally 
um, our regional trade show season, um, where we, we we go to shows that maybe encompass you know four to five states. Um, and there's actually you know we had several of these planned uh, for the springtime, and so I, I kind of started panicking. I'm like, oh, I'm like, wow, this is really going to be a huge problem for us. You know, these are these are big customer facing events for us. You know, we really get a lot out of these events being able to talk, you know, to our customers in, in person, um, you know, showing them our new products that we're going to be launching, you know, this year, uh, just a lot of great, you know, things come from these shows. So I started, you know, and as this was going on, we started to see a lot of, the, you know, the virtual meetings being, being, um, you know, starting to, to be hosted. Uh, you saw the yeah. Zoom craze kick off. So I started thinking like, hold on a second, maybe we can do a trade show, you know, also virtually, like we're we're doing, uh, you know, meetings. It's kind of funny. Dale and I, I think we we both came up with the idea by the same time because I I called Dale and about the same time he was getting ready to call me and say, hey, what if we do this virtually? Um, so we we kind of came up with the idea ab about the same time. Um, and then the other major customer facing event that we had scheduled also in the spring of 2020 um, was our distributor seminar. Uh, these were actually these two events very that we traveled to. Um, actually, one was scheduled in Portland and one was scheduled in Baltimore. And this is actually mm -hmm. where we meet with our distributors. We invite them to come. Um, we bring um, our product managers and we basically showcase all of our products and many of our new products, you know, to the group of distributors that attend these things. So, uh, again, you know, we were in jeopardy of, you know, not being able to host these very important customer facing events for us, you know, coming up yeah. in, the, uh, you know, early 2020. And, and a, a big part of this, too, is that, and this is something we'll touch on later, but these two events, they're for completely different uh, crowds of people. So we needed to find a way to make them kind of different events completely. And, and this is something we'll touch on later in there. But um, today, what we're going to cover is the virtual trade show and the virtual distributor seminar. But we're going to see how we created those programs, why we created those programs, and then also how we promoted them. And, and the biggest part of that is what the results were that came out of it, too. So. We'll start off with the with the virtual trade show first. Um, Ed, talk to us about how we came up with that idea. I know that we had the booth already beforehand, and we had a lot of that collateral simply because we would set that booth up prior to that. That's correct, right? Right, Chris. So you know, initially, my first my first idea of what this virtual trade show would look like was I, I kind of envisioned where someone would go you know to a website, they could click on you know one of our products that we would traditionally show. Um, at the trade show, and it would be a you know a, a 3D model or some type of animation that they could visually you know look at it. Um, you know we do a lot of this with um, um, augmented reality in some of our apps where mm -hmm. you, know, you can get 3D renderings. Um, so that was my first thought. But then the, when I started talking to Dale, you know kind of what we both came up with was, hey, wait a second. You know we we pretty much have all this trade show equipment at the exhibit. Uh, logistics warehouse because traditionally what we do is before a major show um, we'll actually set the trade show up in exhibit uh, exhibit warehouse and it'll be the exact replica of the footprint that we would have at the trade show so we yeah. have all the equipment laid out and then you know then we pack it and we ship it to the trade show so we actually had a um, our, our first big regional show was coming up in a couple of weeks so all the equipment was already um, out. Well, actually, I'm, I, I'm sorry, it was already packed and getting ready to ship. So mm -hmm. what Dale and I decided to do was let's set the trade show up on the warehouse floor, just as it would be on a trade show. We have all the equipment yep. right here, and then we'll just film the, you know, each of the basic product stations. Um, I can do a, you know, a quick product overview, just like I would at a, a traditional trade show, as if I was talking to a customer. And, you know, we can film these segments and then we basically put it on you know, a website you know, or somewhere within the OPW website, and then people could go and basically view exactly what they would have seen if they would have showed up in person to one of these regional trade shows. Um, so it yeah. actually ended up being um, you know, much more cost, cost effective that way, you know, to have uh, someone you know, do the, the animations and 3D models, it gets pretty expensive. And yeah. already I'd been given the initiative, you know, we saw what was happening with COVID and you know, businesses uh, you know, business levels beginning to fall off. Uh, basically, I was giving the initiative, hey, we got to cut all marketing spend. So anything we do, it's got to be done, you know, very inexpensively. And the fact that our equipment was already at, 
exhibit logistics warehouse and just with me filming this we're able to put this thing off with very at a very very low cost point and the biggest benefit of this too is as you had mentioned we we split those videos up um, by each of the different areas that we had worked in and we it allowed people to view them similar to how you had said as they would in a trade show because when you're going to a trade show you're not necessarily going through to every single piece of equipment as, as you would on an online presentation, you, it, you're really looking at what you need to look at. So it allowed people to kind of break away from that idea of the death by PowerPoint or death by Zoom that, that, that we're, we're starting to realize so much with this work from home uh, setup that most people are doing. And it allowed people to kind of view those shorter videos. Um, so it, it, let's talk about the scripts that we, we had made for this. You, we set up some scripts and things, but they were more just a dialogue how you and your team would talk to people at a trade show, correctly? Uh, right, Chris. So, you know, what I wanted to do was I, I didn't want it to be like a, you know, like a product overview where someone clicked on something and they just heard me rattling off about the features and benefits of that specific product. You know, I really wanted to be more, you know, interactive. So the way I wrote the scripts, well, let me back up. The way that we did this were probably eight different products or product stations mm -hmm. that we had. And, you know, like you said, my idea was I wanted someone to be able to go to and they could just pick and choose, you know, individually what segments of our trade show booth they wanted to view at that time. I didn't want them to have to view the whole thing. Um, I wanted it broken down into pieces so they could, pick, you know, pick exactly what product interested them. So, you know, a lot of the presentations I kind of just did, you know, really off the top of my head, um, you know, having yeah. done these, these presentations, you know, so often at, at other trade shows. Um, and then some of them, you know, were pretty lengthy. There was a lot of information. So um, I actually wrote a script and we had a teleprompter that I used as we, as we taped these. But again, the, the script was, I want it written as if I was talking, you know, to someone across, you know, the, the trade show floor with me, um, yeah. you know, as I was presenting these products. So it was kind of a more, you know, had a more personal feel to it rather than just a, a, a list of features and benefits on that specific product or that topic we were discussing. Yeah. yeah. And, and and the the biggest benefit too was as you had mentioned utilizing that exhibit logistics facility we were able to actually set up these booths while still keeping socially distant. Um I know that it provided a safe environment for everyone both for you and for our, our team but it still allowed us to have that same feel that we would have because of the fact that it was set up in this this kind of plain white facility that that for the so the backdrop was pretty uh, similar across all of it. Um, so Emily, let me ask you then, using the uh, the teleprompter that we had and kind of the setup that we did, I know that our team actually was able to help uh, coach through the whole setup and then actually provided the videographer to do all of the video production as well. Yeah, so um, being a marketing agency, we have a lot of these resources in house and we do have a videographer on our team who's in the photographs there. Um, so we sent him out to the facility. We set up the booth, as you can see, and um, I think he started his day by kind of shooting some B-roll just of the booth so that we had good shots of all of the products. Um, and then we took time to shoot all of the individual videos that Ed talked about. Mm -hmm. um, so it took about two days to do that. Um, and then our team brought that video back to our facility, um, went through, edited down to the final cuts that we wanted for each video and prepared those uh, to be used on the actual website. Yeah, yeah. And, and so how did we come? Yeah, Ed. Yeah, and no, I was just gonna touch on, you know, the safety aspect of this. You know, if you think about, you know, we really shot this thing right at the very beginning, the, the, the heat of the, the COVID crisis. And there are huge mm -hmm. concerns, um, you know, about safety. Um, so, but this was great because it just allowed you know, it was basically me and the, the videographer, you know, in this large space. So we were able to maintain distance. Um, there was, you know, there really wasn't anybody else um, around as we did this. Um, thankfully, the facility is actually just right down the road for me. So there was no travel involved. Um, so yeah. we were still able to, to put on this production um, following all the CDC guidelines, all the Dover, you know, safety guidelines and OPW guidelines that have been put in place for their employees. And, um, mm -hmm. and we were able to do it very quickly. Like Emily said, you know, we basically did this thing in two days, which was really amazing to me. Yeah, yeah, no, that is, that is. And, and, and from that, we came up with all of this video content. So Emily, how did we decide to come up with the website idea? Um, I know that that was something that we had discussed back and forth. We had originally, as Ed had mentioned, 
thought about doing some animations or maybe doing an actual walkthrough so people could kind of go through there. But we eventually came up with this idea for the virtual trade show website. So tell us how we got to that point. Yeah, so we knew that we wanted to disseminate this through the OPW website. So we needed a landing page. Um, it was really just a matter of what is that going to look like and what will the experience be. Um, so I think initially... This was, a landing page. this was a landing page that was on the, the existing OPW website, correct? correct. Yes, we just yeah. built um, a home within the website specifically for this event. But mm -hmm. um, I think you guys hit on it a little bit, but the initial thought was like, oh, we'll make one big video and we'll go through each part of the trade show. And then as Ed mentioned, um, people don't go through our trade show booth like that. So the more that we yeah. thought realistically about how our customers interact with us at trade shows, the more we tried to tailor this specifically to produce the same sort of experience. Um, mm -hmm. So that's when we decided, you know, we do individual product presentations and people gravitate towards the products that are most relevant to them. So let's make sure we break down the big video into sections where they can go specifically to those products. Um, and then another thing that we thought about um, at trade shows is that we always have literature on the booth yeah. floor so we can send that with people that come to visit us. Um, so we wanted to make sure that there was a component of the landing page that created that same experience. Um, mm -hmm. So kind of small down there, but you can see on that slide that um, each product in the video had a tab down at the bottom of the page where they could read a little brief paragraph about the product, see the 3D image that we've produced, download any resources that we have, and actually link out to the physical product page on the website for more information. And that and was the beneficial. About, not The great thing about this for me was all this content we already had, you know, Dean Houston had already developed yeah. this. So we were able to do this with no additional cost to me. Uh, we already had the additional marketing collateral. So we're just able to tag it on to each of the product presentations. So that, that I was very happy with that and, and very pleased with what we were able to, to put out in that aspect. And, and a big benefit of this too, and Justin, you can elaborate on this a little bit, is the fact that we were actually able to, um, to track all of this information too, through how we actually set the uh, the technology that we use to set this up. It was a simple technology, but by using a tracking code that we did, we could actually see which products people were most interested in and then which products people actually wanted the more information about, um, which is something we actually normally can't do even at a, a, an in-person trade show. So Justin, talk to us a little bit about that technology and how that technology uh, was was so easy to set up. Yeah, sure. So when we we're trying to think about how to set up these videos, we could have gone some, the route of something like a go to webinar or some third party integration. But uh, I know one of Ed's requests was to keep it OPW branded on the OPW website. So what we wanted to do was give something that was modular um, and inexpensive to implement. So we we what we decided to go with YouTube and build kind of a, a self contain static HTML page. And what that does is there's no license fees, no additional costs. Uh, most companies have a YouTube channel and a website. So mm -hmm. we just built this uh, kind of a self-contained landing page where we could swap out videos as needed or think about the future. If we were gonna do another trade show, either with the same client or a different client, we could kind of reuse some of that functionality uh, for, a, for a different trade show. And, and a big part of that that you had actually alluded to is the fact that OPW did already have both their website, which gets a ton of traffic in the first place, and they already have a YouTube channel that has a pretty solid following. So hosting these videos on YouTube, a big part of that is that we can also use them on YouTube and they can be reused in future settings too. So it's not just for these virtual trade shows that we're able to actually use it. It's content that that just keeps on giving, I guess you could say. Um, right. And, then, and, and I was just going to say with your with your analytics, you're going to go into analytics tracking here, too. But, you know, thinking ahead of the time, setting up analytics for tracking downloads and uh, video plays and things like that, things that you should have on your website already by keeping it on your current website, you could use the same code and the same tracking uh, and set up new dashboards and new analytics segments without having to think for a new website specifically. Exactly. And that's something that we're kind of getting into here is the the idea of making this gated content for lead generation. Um, Emily, I know this is an idea that you guys had come up with. It, 
it's not that different from a from a actual in person trade show, correct? Yeah. Um, at a trade show, everybody's going to come in. Um, they're going to have a badge, and using those badge, you can kind of track through who's coming through the booth, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. And that was something we wanted to know who people were, but we didn't want to make it a barrier to them getting into the website. So we kind of came up with this idea of could we make it look like they're filling out their virtual trade show badge? Um, and we went to yeah. Justin with a little bit of a pie in the sky idea and he said, totally, we can do it. And um, within a couple of days, we had this neat little intro into the website that I think people actually really appreciated and liked rather than were afraid of. Yeah, it was an idea of normalcy in this time of uh, uncertainty, which I think definitely, uh, it was a playful way of, of reminding everyone that this is still the same information they would have gotten at a in-person trade show, but just in a newer setting. And I think the biggest part of this too is the fact that, as Justin had alluded to, we had an integration into both Infusionsoft and Google Analytics for this. So Infusionsoft, for those of you who don't know, is an OPW CRM program that they use. It tracks form entries, and then anyone really that has any connection to the marketing for, uh, for OPW, which allowed us to see who attended multiple times, who was actually, tra it allowed us to track who was attending the uh, the show, and then also connected into Google Analytics. So we could actually see, you know, which individuals were viewing which videos, which products they were looking at, what people were most interested in. So we could actually uh, market to those people further in the future. So um, this was a way that we could actually mimic the ability for the sales team to gauge which products were actually the uh, the most popular as well. So Ed, how did that work out for your team? I know that we were able to, to uh, utilize a lot of this information. Those leads are then being passed on to your team as well. Right, so this was actually, you know, kind of like an added bonus, um, you know, something that I really didn't even think about when we first came up with this idea of the virtual trade show. But the information that I was able to get, um, you know, from the, the sign up of, of the show was invaluable. You know, I could see exactly, you know, the, the type of people that actually came to the show, you know, that logged in, uh, you know, I was able to see the content that they viewed, but more importantly, I could see, you know, who those people were. And really what surprised me was, you know, I expected people like our distributors, you know, some of the, our major end users, our big customers, you know, those are the people that I expected to attend this thing. But what really surprised me was the, the other types of people that actually came to the show and was viewing our content. I had a number of different um, regulators from, I think, about 12 or 13 different states. Uh, you know, these are state regulators that are either involved in the EPA or, or, or something within their state where yeah. they, uh, you know, regulate underground storage tank and gasoline station equipment. So I was really surprised and impressed and, and actually very thankful that we actually, you know, generated the, um, you know, the attention to these state regulators. Uh, engineering firms and architectural firms. We had a number of people from those types of places come in and view our trade show. Uh, there were people from universities. We had several universities uh, attend and, and, and view our content. And even outside of our industry itself, um, I received a, a message on LinkedIn um, from a, another big marketing firm here in Cincinnati uh, that came across this and you know said, hey, what a great idea, great job on this. You know, I'm not even in the uh, petroleum industry, but I watched this thing because I thought the, you know, the concept was really cool and you guys did a great job, you know, putting it together. So not only being able to track the specific content that people were interested in, but being able to look at the types of people, you know, where they were coming from um, was a huge uh, bonus for us. And, um, you know, again, being able to use that all, all that information and those leads and pass it down to our sales team, you know, to have follow-ups with those individual people that signed up and, and viewed our show. Yeah, that's great. That's that's great. Um, so so kind of pivoting off of that, a similar setup, but in, in a different realm was the virtual distributor seminar. So a little bit of background on this. And also, I just wanted to mention, I've seen that we've had a few questions come in. Um, we're actually going to be taking some questions at the end of this, so we'll be answering those. Uh, at the end of the presentation, but if you have any questions throughout, feel free to put them in the question box down below and we'll make sure that we get to those at the end. Um, but as I was saying, the virtual distributor seminar, a little bit of background on that. Um, OPW hosts a series of these distributor seminars, but they're for their close-knit group of distributors. And Ed, uh, 
I, I'll let you kind of emphasize on this, but a lot of that is proprietary information that we really don't want to share with everyone. And there's some company specific updates. So I know that we, while the virtual trade show was open to the general public, this we needed to be a more, a more um, intimate and uh, private event, correct? Uh, right, Chris. So, you know, as I said earlier, you know, we're an industrial manufacturer, but all of our equipment is sold 100% through distributors, through a distribution network. So um, obviously we have a very close relationship um, with these distributors and, and our, our distributor network. And, you know, interesting, you know, back in March when I, I saw what the impact was going to be, you know, not only on the trade show, but the, the fact that we were going to have to cancel our two distributor seminars, I think that probably, I was probably more disappointed in the distributor seminar than I was in the trade show, because it, it, I, I tell the, when I, I host these every year and I tell our distributors that I, I feel that this seminar is really probably one of the most important things that we do every year um, from a sales and marketing standpoint. You know, it's our chance to, you know, meet one-on-one -on -one with our distributors. You know, our distributors are so important to us. You know, that relationship is so important. Um, you know, OPW has been around for over 125 years. And, and the reason we've been successful is because it's the success of our distributors. So um, yeah. if our distributors aren't successful, OPW is not successful. So it's very important that we have these seminars to give them the information, to give them the tools, you know, the things that they need to go out and sell OPW products. So I was devastated we weren't going to be able to have these these live events. Um, but then as we started coming up with, with, with the ideas for this, um, you know, I was kind of pleased this was going to be a, a really good substitution. And a big part of this is is that with those distributor seminars, there's a it, it's a back and forth, it's a and A that kind of goes along with it. So not dissimilar from the virtual trade show, they they give a presentation. Um, a lot of your sales team do on on how the the uh, each of the products that you're displaying are going to work and the the different updates that you have. But the really unique portion of this is the fact that you have that that Q and A that discussion with the distributors at the end of it. So we needed to find a way to to capture that. Um, and and the biggest part of that was was finding a way that we could mix both pre-recorded videos and then also that live. Uh, Q and A. So, Emily, I know this is something that you had actually come up with uh, with Justin and I. Um, can you talk us through how we kind of came up with that idea for the uh, the the live um, platform, and then how we utilize YouTube Live as that that main way of doing this? Yeah, absolutely. So, again, this was kind of a situation where we sat down and really thought about the in-person experience and how to replicate that virtually. Um, we were lucky enough that in February, before the big COVID kind of hit, we did have a chance to go to the sales meeting for retail fueling. Um, and the sales meeting, we run sessions there that are very similar to what we do at the distributor seminar, almost kind of a dress rehearsal. Um, so we looked at the sessions that we did at the sales meeting and said, which one of these are going to translate well to this virtual environment and so we came up with seven sessions that all were topical about different products um installation procedures etc um and then we thought about what we wanted to provide um within each of those sessions and we know that in person they're always really interactive and it gives distributors a chance to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation about their individual questions um, mm -hmm. So we wanted to make sure that we had a component where we could go live um, and answer their questions as they came in. Um, the big struggle, I guess there were two big struggles. Um, one was logistics wise. Um, with COVID going on, we weren't able to send out a vid videographer to film these um, and bring everybody into one place and just go through it quickly. So we really relied on Ed and his team to um, work with us and make sure that they kind of came in and did it in a safe way, one-on-one, -on -one, et cetera. Um, and then the second issue we had is that it's actually really hard to find a platform that allows you to do a pre-recorded video and a live segment of the same session. Um, and in the same quality. That's the, yeah. that's the other big portion of it too. Yeah. Absolutely. So that was um, really our big unknown going into this as we prepared all the materials was like, we're gonna do this and with the idea that we're going to do it in live and pre-recorded at the same time, but we have no idea how to execute that. And um, I'm really proud of the way, Chris, you and Justin, your team um, responded by 
really searching out every corner that we could. We were talking to church pastors about how churches do it and all these different uh, places, video gamers, um, to figure out what the best avenue would be. And we did find a third party that would integrate um, and make this happen for us. And, and I was gonna say, Justin, that the uh, the background on this really comes from uh, video games. And, and this was uh, an area that you, had some experience with, and and so explain that third-party platform. We don't have to go into too much detail about it, but uh, w the benefit of it really was how one we could seamlessly transition between uh, the the pre-recorded video and the live video. But utilizing YouTube Live, we were actually able to have that live chat function. And and, and the biggest benefit of all of this was the fact that it didn't cost us anything for that. Correct? Yeah, that's correct. So like Emily said, we were looking for ways that we could do stuff cost effectively, but also fitting in those same parameters. So similar to the, the trade show part of it, we wanted it to be hosted on the OPW site, um, have sort of a gated login, not have to depend on uh, platforms like Facebook that kind of host them and have a proprietary ownership and things like that. So the, the software we use is just an out of the box solution for those types of streamer software and it, you know, following some instructions and learning kind of how to work the program, we were able to set up that seamless transition. And uh, Chris, you really just sat there as a producer of sorts and yeah. swapped between the different presenters and the videos and uh, Ed led the discussions and it, it was almost so seamless that you couldn't tell we were just flipping a bunch of switches to move things around. Um, but the great thing about it is it's just like the other, the, for the trade show piece, uh, it's reusable. We can scale it to any size we need. We could add more, more presentations to it um, and at the same time, move it to whatever site it needs to be on. So again, it's not locked down to any sort of software that needs to be licensed or specific to a certain platform. Well, and the biggest benefit to this too is the fact that as you had said, it was reusable. So all of that content, because it was hosted on YouTube, was being recorded. So we could actually break each of those videos down into smaller pieces for future usage and actually make them into educational uh, videos that actually is, uh, are now being hosted on the OPW website. And then the biggest part of it was the fact that because of COVID, as Emily had alluded to, we weren't able to do these in person. Uh, so the, the groups for these panels that we had for the live Q&A discussions, they, they couldn't all get together. So we were able to actually, able to actually host these using um, uh, just a, a, your standard Zoom meeting or Google Hangouts, uh, where we could actually have everyone on one single platform together from the safety of their own homes, but having that group discussion. And I think that was the biggest uh, benefit of this. So similar to the the virtual trade show, we had a gated um, setup for this. Individuals were allowed to sign up for each session, but then they, they were also allowed to add these to their calendars. So they, were, they signed up initially to be able to get the calendar invites and then had to sign in prior to each session. Um, the biggest benefit of having that sign up and, and figuring out which uh, calendar invites they, they chose and which sessions they wanted to go to, it gave us one, a precursor as to what we felt were probably going to be the most beneficial sessions, but then also allowed us to send an email out to each of these individuals so that they could beforehand saying, hey, your session's about to start. Um, if you click on this link, you can come attend, which actually helped boost our attendance as well. Um, so Ed, let me talk through this with you a little bit. You actually, you kind of played MC during all of this. You, uh, you were one that actually kind of, you gave an introduction to each video and then also actually led the discussion on the back end too. So talk me through how the setup with your team, how utilizing this YouTube live platform, it kind of eased all of that for your team as well. Right, like I said earlier, you know, one of my concerns was, you know, th this event is a great way for us to interact with our distributors. Uh, you know, traditionally what I would do is, is break, you know, it's a big group. Um, usually we have to cap it off about 70 people um, because of the size of the hotel room or wherever we host it. But then I break them down into small groups and then those small groups will, will meet with a, uh, a product manager and that product manager will give us presentation. You know, so it's, it's very, um, you, you know, kind of one-on-one more, um, you know, rather than giving a, a presentation on a PowerPoint in front of a large group of people. You know, we tried to make it more um, intimate with the smaller groups. So that's kind of what I wanted to emulate you know, with the virtual aspect also. And that's what yeah. we're able to do. 
Um, so I had the, the product managers record their presentation ahead of time because we knew it would be easier to do that. Um, so they were able to do that, you know, one on one, you know, either at their home or um, if they were traveling distance to our, our, our facility in North Carolina, where most of the product managers live. Um, so we had the video, so we would show the video, and then while the video was playing, people could actually ask questions. We had a, a chat room going, um, or they uh, we gave them uh, ways to either email me a question or text me a question, and then we'd take breaks in the in the pre-recorded video sessions, and then we would come on live with myself and my panelists of product managers, and then we would answer the questions. So it was still, even though most of the content was pre-recorded, we still had the live um, interaction, not only with my panelists that the, the viewers could see, but also the, the chat back and forth with the, with the Q&A and be able, being able to take questions live and answer questions live in real time. Um, it, it, it turned out really well. And that chat function, that Justin, that was deliberately chosen because of the ease of use for that. Um, because it, as, as we, we know most people have a Google or a YouTube account. Um, it's just another form of social media. So Justin, talk us through how people were able to actually utilize that chat function. It allowed us to track these folks as well. Yeah, so the, the login, like you said, every, pretty much everyone has some sort of Google account or it's really easy to set up a free one. Um, we also have abilities to link an existing email address to a Google account. So in just thinking ahead of time, we can get everybody set up for chat. Um, but like you said, the great thing about it is uh, it's you get the engagement from that channel. It goes into the tracking software that Google has for YouTube that ties into analytics. Uh, but at the same time, when you store these live events on your website or on your YouTube channel, the chat is preserved. Um, so people can yeah. look in real time and watch the chat back. So even if you don't get to attend the seminar, rewatching the video, you can see the progression of the chat and what questions were asked at what time. And that's important too, because it allows us to to see exactly who, whereas on um, some of the other platforms, it's a more anonymous program. On here, it's actually, we know exactly who's asking these questions. So the sales team that, uh, you know, that interact with these distributors on a daily basis, they can then follow up with them separately as well. So it gives us a lot of flexibility on that end. Now, we have, promoted both of these events. Uh, I know we had a question come in asking about how we promoted these events. And really that's uh, that's two different ways that we did it for both of these, depending on as we had talked about what the audience was. So Emily, talk us through a little bit about this. I know that for the virtual distributor seminar, we needed to be able to do it through um, an email promotion because it was to a very select group of people and we didn't want everyone to know about that. So, uh, so Emily, just talk us through how we came up with the email promotion idea for that. Correct, yeah. So um, we definitely did not want to send this out to the public because it was specific to the distributors that we have existing relationships with. Um, but we do communicate with them regularly through email. So we decided the best way to get them involved was to create an email blast campaign. Um, yep. And we set up some dependencies on it so that if somebody did open the email, uh, they would automatically get a follow-up email that was specific to the action they took. Um, if they didn't open the email, then we'd send them a follow-up that reminded them about the opportunity. Um, and we sent those, I think, between a week and two weeks out to begin yep. with. That's um, and then, like you said before, uh, the last email came in 30 minutes before each session that they signed up for um, to remind them that it's about to start and they can jump in. Well, and a big benefit to that, too, was that we already had these email templates built. So similar to how Ed was talking about how the trade show booth for the virtual trade show was already set up, these emails were already set up as well. So we really just need to change out the content, making it a really low cost effort for that. But it had a pretty big driving factor. Um, those final emails that we sent out 30 minutes prior to the event actually helped boost our attendance by almost 30 percent on each of those um, attended sessions. So just minor, minor things like these email campaigns help us in the long run. Um, now on the flip side, the virtual trade show, we wanted everyone to know about that. So talk to us about how we used uh, social media for that as opposed to email. We didn't do any email for that campaign and, and based it all around the social media aspect, correct? Um, I think we did one email out to our distribution list again, just to make sure that they were aware. Well, and had yeah, to the distributors, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, we wanted it to reach as broad of an audience as possible. We wanted to bring in those people that wouldn't traditionally be at our trade shows, but that could benefit from the information like the regulators and the universities that Ed mentioned. Um, so we really relied on our social platforms where we do have a pretty good following. Um, we used screenshots from videos. We used quotes of what Ed was saying. Um, we developed a really quick, easy little animation to kind of illustrate the idea of it. Um, mm -hmm. We spent, like it says, $75 on Facebook and $75 on LinkedIn, boosting a couple of posts um, and got some pretty incredible results just in the number of people that we reached. Um, yeah. and the number of people that came into the trade show as a result of those so social media was a great driver from us for us excuse me um and the other thing that we used were banner ads um mm -hmm. we did those in some of the industry e-newsletters and things and also brought in leads that way as well so we were actually about we were able to average about a dollar per um per engagement for both LinkedIn and Facebook, which uh, ended up being a pretty good result for that. And that ended up being about a fifth of all of the people that attended the virtual trade show. So overall, it, it, it ended up being a huge boost for us. But the biggest part about this was that, uh, as we had alluded to previously, we were able to integrate this into, excuse me, OPW's CRM. Uh, so we were actually allowed to track all of these. And what that did in the long run was it made it kind of changed these people from just being attendees to also being leads. So we could, these people we could actually look at um, in, in the future as well as potential leads for email campaigns, for uh, products, for follow-up on, on, uh, by the sales team. So it really made this seamless integration between the page views, the form fills, and the emails to get a complete picture of how people were attending this event, which uh, pieces of the event were the most popular, and then really what the uh, the overall benefit of this was for for uh, for OPW. So after all of this, we completed both of the programs. We found that we had uh, um, some pretty stellar results from this. So just to give you a background here on our previous results for most of these, we average around 75 to 100 leads per trade show. Um, and then our distributor uh, seminars, as Ed had mentioned, we average around 75 attendees for that as well. So as of today, we've actually had 573 people attend the virtual trade show, um, which is, uh, that's actually a, a gigantic number. And it's something that is still rising because the trade show is actually still live as well. So I have one more question for everyone here. From those, uh, the, both of these programs, in the information that we just provided, how many leads do you think that we actually started or we actually gained from this? So I'm going to open another poll here for everyone. Give everyone just a minute to, uh, to take a look at that. All right, starting to get some numbers here. Give everyone just another 10 seconds or so. All right, so it looks like most people think that we got around 600, 500 or 650 leads. We actually doubled that. Uh, so far, we have had 1,246 total signups for the, for the virtual distributor seminar, averaging about 178 leads per session. And we averaged around 60 attendees per session. So we, we have a number of attendees that weren't able to make it, but we've actually seen in the video views by posting those virtual distributor seminar videos on the distributor portal on the OPW website, a lot of people are going back and viewing those again. And between the two programs, we've had over 1,000 unique leads. That is actually more than all of 2019 combined. Um, it, it was a huge, huge benefit for us. It's a 350% increase over the total number of leads for all of 2019. Um, and as we had mentioned before, the biggest part about that is that this is content that's just going to keep on giving. It's content that we can reutilize over and over again. Um, Ed, I know that we're actually looking at um, posting a lot of those videos for future social content. Uh, for the virtual trade show, and, and and tell us how your team has been able to utilize this this content uh, past these actual events going into the future now as well. 
Right. You know, the, the biggest thing, especially with the virtual um, distributor seminar, you know, I had mentioned, you know, we were really limited to the number of the people that could attend, you know, one of these seminars just because of the constraints of the size of the, the room that we had. Well, what this allows us now is, you know, we can reach all of our distributors, you know, that like so a thousand people can come, um, you know, and view this. And as you said, you know, it's going to be on the website for, you know, hell, it could be on forever, but so it's on there for a long period of time. So now our sales team or what a lot of times what the distributor seminar was set up for is new people to our industry. You know, a distributor will hire a new salesperson and they need to get trained. And we really use the distributor seminar as a training platform, you know, for these new people. So now if a distributor hires a new salesperson, they can sit them in front of the computer and just have them watch, you know, the distributor seminar videos with the questions and answers. And it, it's a great training tool, you know, as we bring new people into OPW and also as our distributors bring new people on into their organization. It's a great way to get people quickly up to speed on the benefits of OPW products. Exactly. It, it turns it from being just a, a single learning event into almost more of a program that can be utilized over and over again. So uh, this is, it, it's something that we definitely will be able to look at uh, more and more going into the future. And a big benefit of it, um, as we had mentioned, was the fact that we were able to track all of this. So we were able to utilize the Google tracking codes that we had set up on all of these websites and then actually track all of this in a dashboard where we can view who, exactly who is viewing all of these programs from their age to where they're located what pages are getting the most view, and then also what products are getting downloaded the most. So this information is available in real time and it's actually still updating considering uh, we still have that virtual trade show up and, uh, and, and uh, going. So now we're gonna open it up to a few questions here. Um, Emily, we got one question that came in asking about the, um, the cost of doing all of this. Uh, and, and I know we can't give an, an exact cost for each, but uh, what would be a ballpark availability for this? Or, or um, how can people reach out to you or our team to be able to actually get those ballpark costs as well? Yeah, so um, it is difficult to give an exact cost just because there is so much that varies with this. Um, the virtual distributor seminar is going to vary based on the format, the number of sessions, et cetera. The trade show has even more factors because it depends on the size of the booth how many products are involved, um, lots of other things there. But I did go back, I checked out our billing um, historically and then we, what we did for the virtual trade show. And it looks like we cut the cost of going to a trade show um, down to about 30 to 40% of what it was to actually go to the show in person. Um, so obviously if there's a 10 by 10 booth, that's gonna look a lot different than what um, our booth did, I think it was a 50 by 20 or 30. It was a pretty large booth, um, but it was about 30% of the cost of what it would have been to attend the show in person. Um, and then the virtual distributor seminar um, was even a bigger cut from what the in-person event would have been, um, especially because we were trying to be super cost conscious with that. So I think we were right around 10 to 20% of an in-person event for that. That's great. That's great. Um, we got another question. Justin, uh, I'll, I'll pass this one to you. So um, they wanted to know, what was the name of the third-party software that we used and why did we decide to use Google Hangouts instead of GoToWebinar for this panel? Um, so I, um, I want to say, what was, yeah, so the the, pro, the software we used for the distributor seminar was called OBS, uh, Open Broadcaster Software. And like I said, it's a, it's a free and open source program that lets you record your screen, share face cam. It's kind of what the, if you've ever seen like a Twitch stream of a video game or anything, it's kind of what they use a lot of the time. Um, and then the reason we went with Google Hangouts was kind of, it, it wasn't a necessary usage. We don't have to use Google Hangouts. We just, that was what was comfortable between Dean Houston and OPW. Um, I know like Zoom has availability. Um, also, I know people use uh, Microsoft Teams, uh, seems to be have, it, it's really about the capabilities of being able to share that screen in a stream. And since we were using YouTube and Google 
also owns Hangouts, we kind of went that route to let's keep it all in the family to kind of yeah. prevent any sort of issues. And, and Google Hangouts, another benefit of that too, is that they actually have a presentation mode for panels um, where you can actually remove the names of each individual. Uh, so we were able to actually set it up so that people, it didn't, to the, to the average viewer on the virtual distributor seminar, they did not actually see any of the names. So to them, it just looked like it was native and built into YouTube. Another big benefit of that too, and I know the question here, it says why Google Hangouts instead of go to webinar for each panel. Um, GoToWebinar has, um, a, a, it's a tiered approach where, where it can cost you uh, money to actually use that. Whereas uh, Google Hangouts and um, some similar pl platforms, I know Zoom for a while was offering free service. Google Hangouts, as long as you have a Google account, is free to use. Um, so we were able to actually set that up so that all the individuals had to do uh, for each of the panelists was accept the meeting invite that they were sent. And then they were actually able to go into this free program and actually utilize that. Um, we found that the streaming quality of that also was probably the, the best out of all of them. Um, so Ed, we have one more question for you. Um, if uh, trade shows and seminars come back in 2021 uh, to, to as we had known them to be in the past, uh, would you consider replacing some with digital versions or doing a mixture of both live and digital? Is that something that you think might be beneficial going forward? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, if you think about it, there's really no replacing the, uh, you know, the one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, contact, you know, meeting someone face-to-face, -face, you know, in, in the trade shows, you know, not only on the trade show floor, but really where we get a lot of benefit from a trade show is not necessarily standing and talking to the person on the floor in front of the product, but it's that social interacting after the show, going out and having dinner, having a beer, um, you know, really building that relationship with that customer. Uh, obviously, that's a big piece that you can never replicate virtually. So I still think it's very important, you know, for one-on-one, -on -one, um, you, you know, person-to-person -person interaction. However, you know, the, the piece on the digital side, on the virtual side, you know, we've seen is also a very um, important and beneficial. You know, we talked about being able to gather the information and seeing who's coming, um, you know, what they're interested in. So I think, you know, my vision in the future is kind of like a hybrid of these events where we'll host a, um, you know, we'll go to a trade show, but while we're at the trade show, we'll film the individual product stations, just like we did with the with the trade show set up at, at Exhibit Logistics. We'll mm -hmm. film those. Um, we'll put them on the website in a virtual aspect. So that way people that aren't able to attend the trade show or people that are still reluctant to travel and, and, and be in groups with large um, gatherings of people, um, they can still have that experience and still see the content and still be able to see our products. So my vision in the future is a hybrid of both a live event, but we're also able to take that live event and make it a virtual event to be used after the fact and into the future and gain a lot of the metrics and track a lot of the information that we did you know, from these actual virtual events. And a, another big benefit of that too is the ability to live stream these events. Um, so we can actually set up a camera for those virtual distributor seminars and actually run all of that so that it's also posted online, similar to how we had the Q&A sessions this year. So it really opens up a wide range of, of uh, abilities. And Ed, as you had mentioned, gives uh, a, a whole new group of people that normally wouldn't be able to attend these things, whether it's for you know cost functions or or just not feeling comfortable to travel, as you had said, it, it opens up a wide range. So we oh, have yeah. one... our, our audience has just been expanded exponentially. Exactly. So we have one more question here. We, we'll, we'll have time for this question and potentially one more if anyone has one. Uh, but how was the user experience for logging into the meeting? And did they have to download an app or did they need a Google account? So um, I'll answer part of this first and then Ed, I'll ask you as well. Um, for, for the user experience side. No, you do not have to actually download an app. Uh, Google Hangouts is run completely uh, through the web and it can actually be attended by anyone whether they have a Google um, account or not. That's for the panelists. Um, going in to watch the actual video, you don't need to have a Google account to watch the video either. Um, if you wanna ask questions in the chat function of the virtual distributor seminar, you will have to sign in through a Google account for that. Um, but what we found, uh, as Justin had said before, most people actually had 
a Google or a YouTube account already. So they were already logged in. So it didn't actually pose to be an issue for many people at all. Um, Ed, from your perspective and your team's perspective, how was logging into the meeting as a panelist? And uh, did you run into any issues or was it a pretty smooth sailing um, kind of login process for you guys? Yeah, I mean, the, the login process was smooth and I'll kind of expand um, you know, on what you said as well. You know, one of my prerequisites that I had when we started setting up both these events was I didn't want people to have to click a link, you know, download software. Um, you know, I've attended other seminars where, you know, you click this link and then all of a sudden you don't have that specific software platform. You have to wait for it to download. I didn't want our users to have to do with any of that. I wanted our users to be able to do all of this right from the OPW website. You know, our users are familiar with that website. They know how to navigate it. They're comfortable with it. So that was kind of one of my demands was, I want this driven on the OPW website. So all people have to do is go to my website, click and they're in. And that made it a lot easier. I think that's actually what helped us with, um, you know, our attendance in, in both events. So I think the user experience was, phenomenal as far as an ease to use, you know, both from the user and like you said, as the as the panelist, um, I'll be the first to admit, you know, I'm no computer guru. I'm, you know, I'm not of the video game generation um, or the digital generation, but it was very simple for me to run and, and moderate our, our virtual distributor seminar as the moderator and the same with our panelists. So user friendliness, uh, very easy. That's great. And, and Justin, one thing that we can say with that too is that as Ed had mentioned, since it's being hosted on the website, that's easily replicable for, for other websites as well, uh, correct? Yeah, so a lot of the functionality uh, is definitely re reusable. Uh, we can just skin it with new branding. We can even change out the layout. That's kind of the benefit of using that static HTML approach versus like a content management system or some sort of more elaborate web programming. All right, and it looks like that is all the questions that we've had so far. If you guys have any more questions, um, feel free to shoot us an email. Uh, you can you can uh, fill out the form on our website, or uh, we will send you an email right after this, and you can respond to that. Um, if anyone has any any further questions, uh, feel free to to ask those later. Um, but we'd like everyone to we'd like to thank everyone for attending, uh, and also our panelists, including Ed. Thank you for joining us today. Um, and we will be sending out a recording of this as well to everyone. So if you would like to pass it along to anyone else, feel free. If there's anyone that, that wasn't able to attend today, uh, you can pass it along to those folks as well. And uh, we hope everyone has a great day. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Chris.